Hi there, everyone. I think that we are live. Oh my gosh, and there's so many comments already. This is exciting. Um, <laughs> I am, hi, I'm Kylie Reed. I'm the author of Such a Fun Age, and I am so excited to be here with Barnes & Noble, and especially with Britt Bennett, the author of The Vanishing Half, which is the June Barnes & Noble Book Club selection. Britt, thanks so much for chatting with me today. Thanks for being here. Yeah. Uh, so we have a lot of good things coming up, including a little reading from Britt. We're going to dive into some of the book club questions and Barnes Noble readers have been exploring those questions. And I feel like we get to ask the teacher like, all of those questions and get all of those answers. Um, and we're also going to be taking some questions from viewers as well. But first, I want to do this properly and introduce Britt in the way she deserves. So Britt is born and raised in Southern California. She graduated from Stanford University and later earned her MFA in fiction at the University of Michigan, where she won a Hopwood Award in graduate short fiction, as well as the 2014 Hurston Wright Award for college writers. She is a National Book Foundation 5 Under 35 awardee, and her debut novel, The Mothers, was a New York Times bestseller. And I think it's like on my shelf, like right there. <laughs> um, her second novel, The Vanishing Half, which I have right here, was an instant number one New York Times bestseller. Her essays are featured in The New Yorker, The New York Times Magazine, and The Paris Review, and Jezebel. So welcome, Britt. And before I ask you a lot of questions, I would love for you to set the scene and read for us a little bit. And while Britt is reading, everyone who's doing comments on the side, if you want to ask some questions for Britt, she can answer those later. So here we go. Britt, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Kylie, for being here, for doing this with me. Um, thank you, Barnes & Noble, uh, for picking The Vanishing Half, and thank you, everybody, for, for watching. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to read a little tiny short section from uh, the, the beginning of the book, and this is a section that introduces you to the town where the, where the, uh, the novel opens and that the novel is kind of about. So this is just from the first chapter of The Vanishing Half. It was a strange town. Mallard, named after the ring-necked ducks living in the rice fields and marshes, a town that, like any other, was more idea than place. The idea arrived to Alphonse de Sore in 1848 as he stood in the sugarcane fields he'd inherited from the father who'd once owned him. The father now dead, the now freed son, wished to build something on those acres of land that would last for centuries to come. A town for men like him, who would never be accepted as white, but refused to be treated like Negroes. A third place. His mother, rest her soul, had hated his likeness. When he was a boy, she'd shoved him under the sun, begging him to darken. Maybe that's what made him first dream of the town. Lightness, like anything inherited at great cost, was a lonely gift. He'd married a mulatto even lighter than himself. She was pregnant then with their first child, and he imagined his children's children's children, lighter still, like a cup of coffee steadily diluted with cream, a more perfect Negro each generation lighter than the one before. Soon others came. Soon idea and place became inseparable and Mallard carried throughout the rest of St. Landry Parish. Colored people whispered about it, wondered about it. White people couldn't believe it even existed. When St. Catherine's was built in 1938, the diocese sent over a young priest from Dublin who arrived certain that he was lost. Didn't the bishop tell him that Mallard was a colored town? Well, who were these people walking about? fair and blonde and red-headed, the darkest ones no swarthier than a Greek? Was this what who counted for colored in America, who whites wanted to keep separate? Well, how could they ever tell the difference? By the time the Veen twins were born, Alphonse de Sore was dead, long gone, but his great, great, great granddaughters inherited his legacy, whether they wanted to or not. Even Desiree, who complained before every Founders Day picnic, who rolled her eyes when the founder was mentioned in school as if none of that business had anything to do with her. This would stick after the twins disappeared. How Desiree never wanted to be part of the town that was her birthright. How she felt that you could flick away history like shrugging a hand off your shoulder. You can escape a town, but you cannot escape blood. Somehow the Veen twins believed themselves capable of both. And yet if Alphonse de Sore could have strolled through the town he'd once imagined, he would have been thrilled by the sight of his great, great, great granddaughters. Twin girls, creamy skin, hazel eyes, wavy hair. He would have marveled at them. For the child to be a little more perfect than the parents. What could be more wonderful than that? 
think I'll still suck there. <laughs> That's a great line to end up. That was really wonderful. And I feel like just hearing it back, I always have this, you know, question behind my mind, like, are people are going to ask questions, but I feel like just me reading, like, like the comments were popping off, like people were very <laughs> <laughs> to talk about this book for very obvious reasons. That was really wonderful. And thank so you. if you're good, I'm going to dive into some of these questions. Let's do it. Uh, so let's start somewhere I love starting, um, which is your title. Uh, I feel that the vanishing half accomplishes so much and applies to so many of the characters. And something I recently heard a reader comment on is how it's not just the twins and it's a very, you know, that's your other half, but at some point, you know, Reese loses a part of himself. At some point, Adele loses a part of her memory. And I was wondering what you were most focused on uh, with accomplishing with this title. Yeah, well, I have to say it was not my idea. Um, I cannot take credit for it. I'm I'm just bad at titling things. If I don't like, if I don't know it immediately, I'm just never going to get there. Um, so it was a it was a community effort. Um, that was uh, really the uh, the credit of my agent Julia um, and my editor Sarah. We all had to like kind of put our heads together to try to think of titles for the book. Um, and when when I think Julia suggested it, I liked it for some of those reasons that you just explained. Um, I thought you know it spoke to a lot of the different characters. Um, the twins, uh, obviously, um, as you said, losing uh, half of yourself when you lose your sister. There's also this idea of Stella kind of losing this half of herself as she's becoming mm -hmm. this different person and assuming this new identity. Um, you know, these other characters uh, like Reese who have experienced some type of change in a way. Um, and, and I think I also just like the fact that the title, it felt visual, you know, it felt, um, it, I, I, when we eventually arrived with the, with the book cover and everything, there was something really disturbing about that image to me. I think mm -hmm. it's, it's a pretty image, but it's also unsettling, I think with the title, because you have these faces and you can't really tell if they're kind of merging together or if one is consuming the other. And there's a, like a tension in that, um. So I think, think it works well with that title because I think there is something unsettling about the phrase, the vanishing half, kind of like, well, what's disappearing, you know? So I, I yeah. like that it worked in yeah. all those ways. I'm glad we landed there. I do too. And I feel that uh, there's something with the vanishing half in many of these situations that it isn't just, you know, it's gone. It's I like how certain people are really busy visible to certain people the whole time. Like there's a moment when when Stella returns and her mom's like, oh, hey, how are you? And just like, like nothing has happened. And it reminds me of, you know, <laughs> right. when you come home from college or something and your parents are like, I know who you are a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I'm exactly. Keep going. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you had that. <laughs> you know, just trying to be cool and trying to be a different person, but that other half still, still yeah. is with you. Um, so also, exactly. does that mean that you usually write without a title when you're crafting something? Yeah, I mean, this title, like the document, I just had it called like Mallard and then whatever, like iteration of the draft. Um, so usually have some type of a working something. Um, but I don't even remember what the mother's, the mother's whatever my document, I went through so many different iterations, because that was also a title that we arrived at very late into the process. So I usually have some kind of thing so I know what I'm working on but it was weird with the vanishing half because there were all these sections in the book that have titles and I was like fine coming up with section titles so I was like okay you can come up with yeah. five or six titles but you cannot come up with one for the book like that was where I was stumped um so uh I was grateful right. that we had a you know a sort of hive mind to try to arrive there that's amazing. I love hearing what uh, writers' draft titles are because, like, for like the most brilliant writers, like, it wouldn't surprise me if your title was like twins or something, and like that would be it. <laughs> it's always a mess. Exactly. Um, so let's, let's go to some characters. Um, many of the characters here are engaged in a kind of performance of some kind uh, from a very traditional setting. Like Kennedy is an actress who later, you know, gets confused to be a soap opera star. Uh, Barry is also a performer. Reese takes on a new role that isn't a costume. And you could probably argue that Stella's whole marriage and lifestyle is kind of a performance. So I'm curious what went into shaping these varying depictions of performance and transformation. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that I think one of the questions I had thinking about this book was particularly in the case of somebody like Stella was what does it mean when the performance begins to feel real? 
And I'm always fascinated when you hear actors talk about that, this, you know, not even necessarily like method acting, but just actors who will be like, you know, in that moment, and I felt like I was whatever character. Um, so I'm always really fascinated by that experience. And I wanted to think about that for Stella of how she goes from at the very beginning, very consciously performing this other person that she kind of names as somebody sort of separate from herself. Um, how she goes from that consciousness to, towards where you see her kind of towards the end where it has become so second nature to her that she's not even really thinking about it twice. Um, so I liked mm -hmm. that kind of question about performance. Um, and, but then I was also interested in these performances that are very temporary. Um, so you, like you mentioned Barry, like Barry um, is somebody who, who uh, embraces this performance of, of gender as a drag queen, but in a way that's playful and creative um, and temporary. Um, and in the same right. way that Kennedy kind of feels more like herself when she's on the stage performing as some other character. Um, so I wanted to think of these performances that are very uh, long lasting and feel kind of permanent like Stella, but I also wanted to think about these performances that are, that are shorter terms and also still meaningful, but something that can be, um, you know, more temporary and kind of the, the sort of, I guess, the tension between those types of performances at play. Right, right. There's so many, it's, it's, when you look at it, there's so many different types of performances that way. And I'm curious if quarantine was not a thing, you have unlimited budget to spend on a <laughs> performance that you would enjoy, where would you go? Ooh, you know, I really, I really, uh, I don't know. I really do miss live. That's yeah, that's so hard. I really do miss live music. You know, I think I, I would love to, to see a concert or something. The idea of going to a concert right now is or, or ever really is kind of unthinkable but um but i i really i saw um i think the last concert i went to was britney howard uh, from the alabama shakes and she's incredible and i'm so happy i got to see her last fall um but yeah i definitely i think i would want to go see a, a concert and hear some live music yeah 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 that makes total sense at this time right now um <laughs> Let's talk about some of the romantic relationships in the novel, which is one of my favorite things, especially between Desiree and Early. That was probably my favorite, but there's also Stella and Blake, and then there's also Reese and Jude. And I would love to hear you talk about how crafting these characters is very different, especially depending on the relation, the relationship between the couples and the past or the truth. And this sounds so silly, but I mean, even with Early and Desiree, they are probably like the most in love. And one of my favorite moments was when Desiree did not allow uh, uh, Jude to sleep in the same room. And she's like, you guys aren't married either, but that's totally fine. Like keep your rules however you want to go. Um, but even with the most successful relationships, it doesn't mean that they're they're always honest about the past. And so I would love to hear about crafting these three relationships. Yeah, I mean, I think that's what I enjoy the most about writing. Um, I just enjoy writing relationships and and, and uh, these sort of moments of tenderness and moments of love, moments of cruelty, the ways in which all of these things kind of pop up. Um, I guess to look at them kind of one at a time, I think Desiree and Early, um, that was a couple that I really loved writing. Um, there were iterations of the book that took a sort of darker turn with their relationship. Like their relationship wasn't, I think, as, uh, as sort of, uh, I don't know if wholesome is the word, but like it ends up being, I think, a, a nice relationship to read about. Um, and at first there was, I think, more, more tension between them. Um, but I loved the idea of them being in this kind of unconventional sort of marriage, you know, they're not legally married, um, but they've been together all these years and they don't even live in the same house all of the time because early's coming and going, but that still does not make their relationship any less valid or any less meaningful. Um, and at the same time, it is, you know, sort of uh, controversial that they're doing this in this very like deeply Catholic town and in the time period. Um, so I love the idea of this as, as this kind of you know, Desiree coming from this relationship, from this marriage that is abusive and controlling and restricting, and then entering this relationship that allows her some space to, to breathe and to, and to feel like she can be free alongside this other person. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I really love that. And, you know, I don't know, I love a sort of relationship between people who meet when they're like, you know, teenagers and, and following what, what does it look like? You know, I love it. Um, and then being like, what does it look like when they're in their forties? And if, you know, what does it look like for those two people? Um, 
so I loved that. And I also loved the idea of Desiree just like trying to pressure her daughter into this conventional marriage that she herself doesn't want. Cause that just felt so like pitch perfect to me <laughs> of, um, mm -hmm. um, of often mother daughter relationships. Um, so I, 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 I've had fun writing that kind of dynamic between them. Um, and I think Reese and Jude, I think that was probably my favorite couple to write in the book. Um, I, again, I'm always, whenever I'm writing relationships, I'm thinking, you know, what do these two people want from each other? Um, and I think for that relationship, you know, you have these two people who have both experienced these very painful pasts. Um, they've both mm -hmm. experienced a lot of violence and shame surrounding their bodies. Uh, so what does it take for them to learn how to love each other and learn how to love themselves? Um, so to me, that was something that I enjoyed writing that relationship of, you know, they begin as friends and it's kind of ambiguous and confusing. Um, right. And you see how right. it sort of unfolds. Um, so I love that. I love an ambiguous friendship also. Um, so uh, so I, I enjoyed writing that. Um, and I think Stella and Blake, um, I don't often get asked about that marriage. <laughs> um, I think that it's, it's obviously- It's a marriage. It's a marriage. Um, I, I also just like enjoy, you know, they have the, again, the most sort of conventional relationship maybe in the, in the book where they are sort of traditionally married and they've got the child in the house in the suburbs and all these things. And yet at the same time, you know, their, their relationship is actually quite unconventional um, because there are giant swaths of Stella's life that Blake has no access to. Yeah. Um, so for that relationship, I wanted to to uh, think about again, what do they see in each other? What does Stella see in Blake? Because it wasn't enough for me to be like, oh, Blake is, you know, he has money or he's got influence or power. That wasn't interesting to me to think of Stella seeing only that in him. So I wanted to think about the way that like, I, I did enjoy writing the kind of, I don't know, the sort of early, I don't even want to call it like a, uh, I don't know, that the early when, when Stella is, meets Blake and she's working for him. I um, love those pages. Those well, I, I know. Yeah. <laughs> I enjoyed writing them, but also like, I, I also wanted to think about Stella like, sort of continually reevaluating that, that sort of very stereotypical kind of boss secretary dynamic that I think now in our, you know, 21st century standpoint, we, we recognize as a problematic. Um, and I think Stella starts to kind of think about that too, but at the same time, thinking about what would it have meant for her at that time to be treated like this by this person. And mm -hmm. to me, that's more important than thinking about, I don't know, how how maybe I would look at it or how I would look at it now, but thinking about like, what was that feeling for her to be taken out to this nice restaurant by this yeah. man? And it would have meant so much to her, you know? So, so right. I, I enjoyed writing the the early Stella and Blake and thinking about kind of what she sees in him as this sort of Prince Charming that kind of rescues her from, you know, whatever she thought her life was going to look like. Um, but also again, as you, you know, see that relationship become a little bit more complicated as they both kind of grow and right. change. Um, that was something I also enjoyed writing. Right. I was wondering if, you know, thinking of their relationship between secretary and boss that like Stella, maybe not knowing it, loves that their relationship started out professional and then keeping that distance their entire marriage is like something that she doesn't even realize that she's looking for. I don't know if you thought about that as well. Right, you know, I didn't think about it like that, but I think that's that's a, a really good reading of it. You know, like it, Stella is somebody who um, prides herself on, on her intellect and her skill and being able to sort of, you know, accomplish things. <laughs> so again, for like that to be the, the way that like she has, uh, she meets Blake and that to be like what pulls Blake into her, and it pulls them each of them into each other's orbit. I do think that that's something that, that would appeal to her in that way. Yeah, yeah. The things that we find attractive secretly are, are scary, so poor stuff. <laughs> um, and then we're going to get into what was my favorite chapter, which was the one with Loretta and Stella. Um, I think a great way to understand who someone has become in the time that you haven't seen them is really watching how they interact with people. Like I understand so much more just watching them in a scene with someone rather than someone just like telling me exactly who they are now. And so I love the chapter because it, you know, her relationship with this neighbor, you know, that, that feeling of like, Oh my gosh, wait, am I going to make a friend here? Oh wait, do you want to hang out? This is fine. It almost feels like exciting, like a crush, but also there's so much going on because this is a black woman coming into Stella's white neighborhood and she has a lot of feelings around that. And so I'm curious for you, what 
specifically is Loretta representing for Stella? And what does Stella bring out about Stella's, what does Loretta bring out about Stella's commitment to her own identity through just yeah. being across the street from her? Yeah, I mean, I think describing it as a crush is accurate. Like that's that's kind of the way I thought about, I, I think, I don't know if you feel this way, but I, I, I think it can often be hard to write about friendship uh, yes. because you don't have the same like shorthands of writing about romance, right? Like when I think about, you know, you think about sort of milestones of romance and maybe you're like, oh, this is the first time we kissed or this is the first time we held hands or went on a date. When I think about like my closest friends, I don't remember the moment that we became friends or like the moment that That's I knew. That's a good point. You know, like I don't know what those things are. And often for me when I'm writing, I think about people confiding in each other, like those being kind of linchpin moments. But I don't often think about that for my own relationship. I just like, oh, we were always friends, you know, which obviously is not true, but that's kind of how I remember it. Um, so for me, I, I sometimes I have to think about uh, sort of that kind of emotion of that lack of, of certainty, um, that, that kind of insecurity, the feeling of not wanting to be, you know, uh, not wanting to be seen in some way that you don't want to be seen by somebody all of those kind of nervous, fluttery feelings of a crush. I try to think about those when I'm trying to develop a friendship. Yeah. Um, and I think particularly for Stella, it, it definitely is because there's something secret about it. There's something forbidden about it. It has that kind of feeling of an illicit affair. Um, so, you know, I wanted to think about ways in which I could push Stella. Um, so the idea of this black family moving into her white neighborhood and not only that, but moving directly across the street from her within like this cul-de-sac. So they're like, it's like a little mirror. Exactly. Yeah, right over front of her. I love that. Exactly. So like that idea was like, okay, that will be great. That's going to push her. Um, <clears throat> so I wanted to think about that. And I think as far as your question of kind of, you know, the, what's the, what's the heart of that friendship, uh, I think for me it was, there's a way in which uh, Loretta becomes this very big threat for Stella. It's not that so much that Stella is like, you know, oh, I, I hate black people. I don't want a black person to move in here. She's really afraid that Loretta is going to discover her. You know, she's afraid that Loretta is going to be able to tell that, you know, she's hiding something in the way that her white neighbors can't tell. So she's, you know, she's acting kind of this fear response. Um, so I, you know, I wanted to think about that. So she's got this kind of fear happening, but also this, there's this allure to Loretta. There's a sense of, there's, you know, there's kind of a sense of glamour to her. There's uh, yeah. a way in which Stella sees her life as aspirational um, in a way that the rest of the neighborhood kind of look like, you know, they're sort of looking down on her, but I think in a way that they also resent and envy her. <laughs> um, right. So Stella sees her life as aspirational, but I think also there's a way in which, you know, of course, Loretta reminds her of her sister. She she is funny like Desiree. She's got some of the boldness and, and, and some of that kind of, personality that Desiree has. So mm -hmm. to me, it was thinking about that section. It was thinking about what is it that draws Stella to Loretta and what is also that scares her about this relationship and having her kind of exist in that tension and being pulled one way and pulled another way and kind of bouncing between those, those poles. Yeah, yeah, there's so much going on there. And it, even just hearing you talk about it now, I think, oh my gosh, Stella must have had these feelings of like, oh, well, she gets to live in this neighborhood and not lie about who she exactly. is. Like, could I have done that? And like, oh, exactly. I'm the problem with doing this in this relationship. <laughs> and I see some of the people in the comments, which I love, people are like, Loretta knew, she knew, I know she knew. <laughs> <laughs> which, you know, maybe she did, but I love to hear what you think about this because on one end, I'm like, maybe she did, but at the same time, I feel like a black woman would kind of hold her cards to her chest. Yeah. Whether she knew or not. I mean, so yeah. what do you think? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I've been asked that <laughs> a, quite a few times. Um, and I will say there were like versions of the book where I answered that question more explicitly or, or like, so there were versions where like Loretta confronts Stella and there were versions, like there were versions where I sort of more explicitly address that question. Um, I chose not to do it ultimately, like not to give a definitive answer just because I, I do, yes. I did like yes. leaving. You know, I liked I liked that feeling of you know because I think that creates that recreates sort of the paranoia of what it means to be Stella, which is that she's constantly yeah. wondering, do they know? Do they know? Do they, you know, so I I love the idea of creating that for the reader. I'm sorry, I'm sorry to say um, to anybody who wanted a definitive answer, um, but I think yeah, I, I I do think that Loretta knows, um, and I and I love the yes. idea of, of what you said, Kylie, of her like kind of keeping it close to her. Um, you know, I think it's it's. 
um, you know, I think about like the the book Passing by Nella Larson, and I think like one of the interesting tensions in that book is is sort of are you loyal to your community or are you loyal to this individual person? And if I am loyal to the this person who has mm. passed out of the community, is that me being loyal to the community or is this me? You know, so there's that that kind of question of you know if this person has uh, you know sort of cast away the community by me keeping her secret, is that actually me being loyal to the community or is that me being disloyal to the community? Um, and I think it's such an interesting question. I don't have an answer for it, but I, but I do like, love the idea of, of, uh, of sort of readers having to kind of sit in that uncertainty. So yeah. I'm sorry, I'm sorry everybody, but I do enjoy it. <laughs> no, I love it. I'm here for it. Also, I love that <laughs> what you're saying from her book too about the community. Cause like she's wrestling with this thing and being like, is this like, you know, bad for my community. Oh wait, who's my community? All these white people here. Like, what does this even yeah. mean exactly. in terms of where I live? So I love that you kept that a lot. Um, and then I'm gonna do one more question before we dive into reader questions. Actually, maybe a few more. Uh, I would love to know <laughs> about your process of writing Kennedy and Jude's relationship. So we have Kennedy who's born into wealth and a mother who's very distant from her. And Jude's mother is low income and has a real, grows to have a really special and sweet relationship with the man who treats her and Jude really kindly. And so I was wondering if you could talk about their dynamic because even though it's very distant and doesn't start until way later and they're cousins, there is like a sister quality to the way that they yeah. relate to each other in a way. So I'd love to know about, more about that. Yeah, I, well, I, I mean, I found that the most difficult relationship to write in the book um, because of some of the reasons that you just pointed out. They are grow up in such totally different worlds. Um, they don't meet each other until they're, you know, in their twenties. So they're kind of who they are by the time they actually encounter each other. Um, and you know, I, I and I also knew that there was a lot of pressure on that meeting. And and, and you know, I think when you read a book like this where, where characters are apart, you're waiting for the moment where the stories converge. Um, so I knew that there would be pressure on them meeting like that. Um, right. But I, I, I did think about their, their relationship as, as sort of antagonistic, um, but but not they're not enemies, you know? they There's a way in which they know how to get under each other's skin, which I right. think is very intimate. <laughs> yes. I think that's actually a sign of intimacy to be able to do that with somebody and know exactly what's gonna get on their nerves. And there is something sisterly about that, you know. I have, yeah. I have two older sisters. I'm I'm the youngest, so I know very well how to annoy uh, my sisters, <laughs> you know. So yep. I love the idea of that being the dynamic. I never imagined that. Oh, these women, they're gonna meet and they're gonna be best friends. Like right. I didn't think that would felt right because they are so different from each other. They have, you know, you know, these really different life experiences and these these. Um, often unkind perceptions of each other. I think they both kind of um, are, make a lot of snap judgments about each other that are that are pretty brutal. Um, but I right. but I love that idea of like knowing exactly how to hurt somebody and that being something that actually shows how intimate your relationship is. Um, mm -hmm. So I, as I kept working on, it, I kept thinking about like what does that look like for these two, yeah. and and I loved kind of imagining what what is what do they look like down the road? What does their relationship look like as they continue to to get older and, and become the people? Yeah, that, that is so true. When you're a sister, when you're a family member, you just know exactly how to take that and just, and it's just like oh. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so we're gonna get into some reader questions in a second. However, I may have made a list of some sisters that I want to ask you about. Okay, so the question is, you are quarantining for two weeks, which sister do you do it with? And it's not like, who okay. do you like more? It's like, which one's going to be best for you for two okay. weeks, just you two? Okay. Um, start with classic, Tia and Tamara. <laughs> so, so are we talking their characters on the show or the actual people? Their characters on the show. The characters on the so show. So Tia, Right, so Tia was like the intellectual one and her mom was right. Jack A, right? And then Tamara was like yes, the really boy yes. crazy one with Tim Reed as her dad. So who do you live with for two weeks? Oh, so do the parents also, are they also included in this? Oh, that's a great question. Sure, because Jack A is great. <laughs> sure. Yeah, okay, if that's the case, then yeah, I have to go with Tia uh, because I think that we would, I think I would have a blast uh, with Jack A. 
Um, and I think, you know, I think Tia, when I, I think quarantine, like you want, I'm, I'm an introverted person. I think being with somebody who's very extroverted would probably be quite draining. Um, so I think Tia and I could sit in like companionable silence and just like read our books side by side and we'd have a great two weeks. Yes, I agree. I see a Tia all the way in the comments. Not a lot. Okay, this one's a little bit harder. Quarantine is happening. Who do you stay with? Solange or Beyonce? Ooh. I hate, I hate to get that political here. I just, yeah, I just that don't is. Want to know. That is truly a political question. Oh man, you know, my as soon as you asked it, my gut just said Solange. I I, I, feel, like, I feel like we, you know, obviously love Beyonce, I love both of them. I think Solange and I would have some really interesting conversations. Uh, we're both cancers, <laughs> so I feel like we would vibe. Um, yeah, I, I think Solange, we would have a great, we have a great two weeks chatting. There you go. There you go. I really like that. Oh, that means your birthday's coming up. When's your birthday? Well, no, it actually just passed. It was uh, June 22nd. There you go. Okay. And the last one is, let's see. Oh, Venus or Serena. Who's it going to be for you? Ooh. I know. That's tough. I know. You know, I think, I think Venus and I would probably get along better, but I do think Serena would be fun. Serena has like a good very goofy affect to her. Like when you see her being interviewed, there's a silliness to her that doesn't come across when obviously you're watching her compete um, and yes. just dominate everybody. But there is like a, there seems like she, she seems like a very fun person and kind of silly and lighthearted. So I think Venus and I probably are more similar personality wise, but I, I'm going to go with Serena on that one. I think that she would make me laugh and, you know, well maybe now I'm, I'm, I'm not going to even act like I would play tennis against her. Like I'm not, even gonna joke about that. I mean, <laughs> two weeks is a lot. You might, you know, you might find maybe, it. maybe in two. No, I could not return her serve in two weeks. Who are we kidding? No. <laughs> we could play some wee tennis. I mean, there you go. Maybe, maybe that. that. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm gonna dive into some uh, some reader questions, and one of the first ones I saw, which I'm always super interested in too, is how long did it take you to write this thing? What was your journey like? Yeah, so I started working on it as uh, after I finished the mothers, but before the mothers came out. So I was in that weird kind of lull before when the book is you're like done working on it, but it isn't out in the world yet, and you're just kind of in that yeah. weird holding pattern. Um, so I started working on it then. Um, okay. So that was I don't know about four or five years ago, um, and and yeah, it took you know it took a series of drafts to really figure this book out. I think the structure was one of the the hardest parts. Um, there's a you know, non-chronological timeline. Right. Um, there are all these different points of view. So it took a while for me to try to figure out exactly how I was going to tell the story and, and try to make it make sense. Um, so so it, was a, it was an arduous journey at times, but I was, I was very grateful that I had you know, a great editor who, who helped guide me through it because I truly was flailing, uh, flailing at first trying to make sense of the story. It's crazy how much you see like, oh, like a book is formed by like other helping people. And that is great. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. exactly. Uh, I saw a question from Laura Knott, which said, how do you pick character names? Character names are one of my favorite things in a novel. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think, I think character names come to me pretty easily. It's the opposite of titles. <laughs> um, yeah. Some of them, like Desiree and Stella, I remember those two just came to me right away. They felt like they the right vibe for who those characters are, their personalities. I love that. Um, so th those came to me pretty early on. Um, I think Jude was one that was very difficult for me. I could not quite figure out what the name of this this kid would be. <laughs> um, so I went yeah. to a lot of, I, I kept circling around J names for whatever reason, but I, I could not really sort of decide on what name that was going to be. So so Jude was a little bit more difficult, uh, but sometimes it, it's just sort of- Do you use baby name websites? Do you ever I, do that? I sometimes use baby name websites, but what I actually yeah. use more is the Social Security Administration website. Um, so any, <laughs> any okay. writers out there, it's helpful because it tells you like the most popular names, um, uh, in the U S by year. So you can choose like in this book, I'm like, okay, what year would they have been born? Give me the thousand most popular names. I usually like scroll down somewhere in the middle. So it's not totally obscure, but it's also not super, super common. 
Right. And then from there, sometimes I'll just pick. <laughs> so right. I find that like a weirdly helpful tool because again, like it'll help you for for the time period if you're writing, you know, if you're like, I need a name, someone born in 1980 or someone born, you know, 75, whatever, it'll it'll give you at least a range of what was common. Um, so I use that probably more than baby name websites um, because it lets you filter for a year very easily. Um, but yeah, so sometimes either it'll it'll come to me right away, I'll have a feeling, or sometimes I will weirdly access right. the social security administration <laughs> website and find a name. There. Oh, I hear that. It's funny because I have done that. I'm not sure if it was social security websites, but when you're looking by year, it really reminds you of how much a name carries. And depending on where you're at, you're like, wait a second, like, why are all these black names? Oh yeah, slavery. That's why everyone yeah, at this time yeah. has these names and everything. Yes. But it reminds you of like what's going on at those times, which is it so does. interesting. It does. Yeah. Okay, I have Jennifer Erickson asking, what are you working on next? Yeah, I'm working on uh, my next novel, um, which is very, very early. Um, I finished a draft earlier in the lockdown. Um, so I hadn't had a time really to go back to it because of uh, doing the virtual book tour. <laughs> um, so now I'm finally, everything is winding down. I'm finally able to go back to, go back to it. So. It's just a no it's a novel about uh, these two singers who have a lifelong feud. Um, so it's been, yeah, it's been fun to write. Um, and I love a feud so much. That's I love great. a feud too. It's really fun to write about hate, you know? It's like a different, it's a really different kind of vibe uh, to write about hate. So I've, I've enjoyed thinking about hatred as like a kind of love story. Right, I love that a lot. Um, I wanna do Barbara Ford who asked, who was your favorite character and why? It's a good question. I, you know, I think uh, I, I think one of my favorite characters was Barry, who's, you know, pretty minor character. Um, but I, I had a friend kind of talk to me about, um, so Barry is one of the friends that she made in LA. Um, and I had a friend who was like talking to me about loving Barry and I'm like, yeah, I don't talk to people about Barry that often because he is a pretty minor character, but I do love him as this, you know, you always have that one friend who's like the center of the social group yes. and who like kind of gathers everybody. Yes. <laughs> and particularly me, like, I know like some of the lines that, that Barry says were things that, you know, I, I, when I went to my MFA program, I was like straight out of undergrad. So I was one of the youngest people there. Um, and I had some like older friends who were you know deeper into their 30s who like kind of took me under their wing and were like we're going to tell you about how life is and we're going to give you advice um so that's kind of the that's vibe so nice. I, I wanted for barry yeah it was very nice and like that was the vibe i wanted for barry and jude of, of him being like okay let me tell you <laughs> like he gives her that kind of real talk it's kind of brotherly but it's also there's something i yeah i've, I've been fortunate to be on the receiving end of those types of relationships those types of friendships of people who are just like, I'm gonna take you in and show you about life a little bit. Um, so I did really love Barry. Um, I also loved writing Kennedy. I know that a lot of people hate her. I don't know if there's any, there's gonna be any justice for Kennedy in the comments. Justice for Kennedy, um, but, she's got attitude. <laughs> <laughs> but I enjoyed writing her, you know, she she's so chatty and and often quite funny. And, and it's fun to write, I think, characters who are very different from yourself. So she's, very different from me in a lot of ways. Um, and there's something about that kind of motor mouth character who just never stops talking. That can be really fun to write. And, and particularly the ways in which she she's sometimes very self-aware and then sometimes lacks all yeah. self-awareness. So I enjoyed yeah. writing Kennedy. I know she does, she does get, you know, she gets on people's nerves, I know often, but I have a very soft spot in my heart for Kennedy. I totally understand that, which is great. I think writers should have a soft spot for all of their characters. So I think that is great. <laughs> and then the last one I'm going to do from the audience is from Michaela England, which is what is your favorite place to write? Ooh. <clears throat> well, uh, I used to love, I, I know, I used to love going to the coffee shop across, like around the corner from where I live. Um, and I'm, you know, very sad that coffee shop writing yeah. sounds like something into the very distant future. Um, but I loved it because there was a feeling of it being private and also public, you know, like you put your headphones on and you see people moving around, but you're not listening really to what they're saying unless you want to kind of listen in. Um, and there's something yeah. about that, that, that I always found really generative, just creatively of just getting outside of your home and, and being out amongst people. 
So I, I do enjoy that. Um, but, but I also like, I've, you know, I've, uh, I also enjoy writing outside in some capacity. So maybe that's outside a coffee shop. You have some outside seating. Um, there's something about that that I, I've realized that I I also just enjoy being able to get up on the rooftop or someplace where you're just, you know, this is clearly just me being uh, sick of being cooped up during quarantine where I'm just yeah, like outside in some way. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> just like out, not in my apartment on my couch. Yep. Um, just yep. outside in some way is what I prefer. But yeah, it's been mostly couch writing for me. My, my couch has gone like like college futon style where she's like covered in books and sheets of paper. Um, yeah. So that's been what my life has been like, but I definitely uh, am looking forward to being able to do some writing outside of that space. Moving forward. I mean, can you imagine like that day you get to go back into that coffee shop and just like sit? I know. It's gonna be, it's gonna be. I know. I took, okay. so, I took so much for granted. I took it I so much for granted. <laughs> I miss the like I miss the annoying people that like I would see. Yeah. When I was there. Exactly. But, but lastly, lastly, I would love to ask you about what your book recommendations are and what you've read recently and what you're loving right now. Yeah. Um, so I'm reading uh, I'm reading the new Isabel Allende book right now, which is called The Long Petal of the Sea. Um, I'm just trying to remember the longer title. Um, and that's been, I just love, I love her work. Uh, so that's been a, a really great book. It opens with the Spanish Civil War and these characters who are in exile. Um, so I'm at the very beginning of the book, but I'm really enjoying that right now. Um, I think some of my favorites that I really, really enjoyed reading earlier um, during the lockdown, uh, I really enjoyed uh, The Glass Hotel, uh, which I know a lot, of, a lot of people love. That was the book that kind of brought me back from my inability to finish reading a book <laughs> when we went to, right. to lockdown. <clears throat> so that's like a really, if you're in some type of a reading lull, that's a great book that will jolt you out of it because it's so propulsive and, and, and compelling and the characters are really fascinating and you get to, um, I'm, I'm loving a book that takes you to multiple geographical locations. <laughs> so yeah. you'll be like on a yacht or you'll be like in New York somewhere, you'll be like in Europe or whatever. So so that's, that's a great book for that. Um, I've also really loved the book Actress by Anne Enright. Um, as I, as I said, I'm, I'm working on this book about musicians and, and celebrity and yeah. fame. Um, so this is a book about the daughter of this uh, Irish theater legend. Um, so it, it, it engages with what I'm interested in as sort of the difference between cele like celebrity and intimacy and the idea that celebrities are people that we feel like we intimately know as yeah. I was just proving when I was talking about all these famous people that I would quarantine <laughs> with. Um, yeah. So, you know, there's the idea of like, we feel like we know celebrities, but we also have no way of ever knowing these people. And in this case, it's this mother-daughter relationship that mm -hmm. kind of exists in that weirdness and that weird tension between fame and intimacy. So that's a great book also. I, I, I really loved that one. I, I would recommend, I would recommend those for sure. Those are great. Those are great recommendations. Anything that makes you feel like you're not on your couch right yes. now is really well, Yeah. <laughs> You won't feel like you're on Zoom. You won't feel like you're on a couch. It's great. I can recommend that. Yeah. That's amazing. Britt, thank you so much. This was really, really fun getting to talk about this lovely book with you. Congratulations on everything. And I really hope to everyone watching, we haven't spoiled it too much. Even if we have, you should still read it. There's so much nuance going on <laughs> in this story. And so if you haven't read it yet, it is available on barnesandnoble.com. Order it. Don't go out. Keep a mask on is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> thank Brit, you. Thank you so much. So much and I hope you have a really great night and novel three goes wonderful. Thank you so much. Okay. Eileen, thanks everyone for watching. Thank thanks, Barnes and Noble. Thank thanks you. everyone. Bye. Bye.